And with that, I will hand things over to Tanya. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Glad you're spending your evening with us. We are going to start with our land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Now on to our speaker. We're excited to have Michaela Hendrick with us here this evening. Michaela Hendrick is the director of Rensselaer Youth Outdoors, a partnership of Rensselaer Plateau Alliance, Dykin Pond Environmental Education Center, and Grafton Lake State Park. She has a passion for radically engaging youth with nature and fostering place attachment through stewardship, education, and play in nature. Michaela is a Rensselaer County native growing up in East Greenbush. Exploring the outdoors has always been a central pillar in her life that has connected her to diverse landscapes across the country. Her connection to nature deepened during her years in college at SUNY Plattsburgh Center for Earth and Environmental Science, where she purchased her first fly, fly fishing rod and fell in love with fly angling. Michaela continued her education at Old Dominion University, pursuing her master's degree in parks, recreation, and tourism studies, and a graduate certificate in conservation leadership. During her time in graduate school, she contributed to research with the National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, focusing on stakeholder perceptions of climate change threatened, climate change threatened resources, visitor use management, air quality, the role of prescribed fire, and barriers and constraints to recreation access. Michaela spends all of her free time fly fishing across Rensselaer County, the North Country, and the East Coast broadly. Welcome, Michaela. Thank you, Tanya, for such a wonderful welcome. Um, before we get started today, um, I have to do a shameless plug and ask everyone to pull out their cell phones and scan this QR code on the screen right now. Um, this will link you to RYO social media pages and e-newsletter. Um, please give us a follow for the latest updates on our programming. Um, we still have spots available for our summer teen programming, our Forest Conservation Corps program. Um, and help us grow our following online. Um, it helps us with our reach and, and get, gets us to more families. Um, so I have entitled today's presentation, Wading into the World of Fly Fishing. So I really appreciate you all taking the time to join us this evening to discuss women in fly fishing, my own journey, and how we can support and empower women in fly fishing. Um, I'll start by sharing a little bit about my journey into the world of fly fishing, which began back in 2019. Um, as Tanya mentioned, I was attending SUNY Plattsburgh at the Center for Earth and Environmental Science um, and was completely fulfilled, um, surrounded by many wonderful people in my program and circle up there. Um, and it was really here, surrounded by many other strong females and mentors in my life, that I really started growing into myself and seeing myself in different capacities that I hadn't before, including um, higher education and going on to pursue a master's degree. Um, and so through all of this growth, exploration and learning, um, I really wanted something new and I wanted something that would challenge me in the outdoors. Um, I didn't grow up spending a lot of formative time in the outdoors. Um, I didn't camp much and I didn't do much outdoor recreation. Um, so without that generational mentorship, getting involved in certain outdoor recreation activities um, proved frustrating and sometimes isolating too. So when I decided I wanted to try fishing along with my partner, Fred, we decided to make it harder on ourselves <laughs> by jumping right into fly fishing. Um, I was gifted my first fly rod and stood on the banks of the Saranac River and in streams and creeks all over the North Country, where generations of anglers have stood before me in pursuit of the same exact thrill. 
Um, we knew absolutely nothing. And thanks to the World Wide Web, became graduates with honors from YouTube University, watching every knot tying, casting, and flag tying video we could to make it all happen and put the pieces together. Um, I remember growing frustrated, really frustrated, um, with months of little to no progress if you're only counting progress as the number of fish you're catching. Um, but I also remember the first time that those things did come together and I hooked a smallmouth bass on my fly rod in the Saranac. And it felt like I had cracked a code of nature, drifting the right fly choice at the right place and at the right time um, and, and having that euphoric moment. So most of you who know me well in my life know that I really pour 150% of myself into everything I do. Um, and this has been true for fly fishing more so than anything else I've pointed myself at in life. Um, and over the next five years, I fell deeper and deeper in uh, and fly fishing became central to my life. Um, the pursuit of the next catch and exploring new waters started driving where I traveled, when I traveled, um, how I would spend my expendable income, the people I wanted to spend my time with, and the life and experiences that I wanted to really build for myself. Um, so each season, my skills grew, my catch rate increased, and I started feeling more confident owning the intellectual gains that I had earned while staying humble to the fact that every new fish and new technique and new place brought with it its own learning curve. Um, but there's always more growth to be done. And I think that's something that's kept me coming back to fly fishing time and time again, um, is that there is no ceiling. And I actually really like that. Um, so in 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, I moved to coastal Virginia to pursue my master's degree in parks, recreation and tourism studies. Uh, being in a new place and embarking on saltwater fly angling was intimidating and thrilling. And yet again, we st started from the ground up as we navigated this new realm. So from New York to Virginia and back to New York, um, I've grown as a woman, an angler, a conservationist, um, despite what can often be a long and lonely, lonely road for women. So now that uh, you've gotten to know me a little bit, um, I wanna provide a quick overview of what this presentation will cover. Um, we're going to look at recreation and the origins of fly fishing, um, gender and uh, how it relates to barriers and constraints experienced in outdoor recreation, um, and some of my own stories and supporting women in fly fishing. Um, and then at the end, we'll leave time for some questions. So uh, because I studied outdoor recreation, it's only fitting that I start by sharing some of the growth of recreation broadly in the U.S., um, so in the 1970s, recreation really boomed um, after World War II with an increase of disposable income and time. Um, naturally, interest in outdoor recreation activities and also the opportunities for those activities skyrocketed. Um, it was really then in the 1970s that we started managing the environment on both a state and federal level um, with recreation use and enjoyment in mind. It really changed how we looked at public landscapes and how public land is shaped in the way that we know today. Um, over time, how we manage outdoor recreation use has also changed drastically. Um, and through visitor use management and recreation research, we now manage areas based on special use. Um, this can sometimes be done through the um, permitting of backcountry and wilderness areas, or the designation of certain trails for certain uses. Think equestrian trails, mountain biking trails, hiking trails. Um, and we also manage for the sensitivity of ecology and environmental impacts through things like carrying capacity determinations or basically how much impact and visitation can an area withstand without environmental degradation. And we now manage based on visitor use preferences too. So keeping in mind things like signage and parking, access to amenities, solitude, um, and those special use areas to provide a diversity of recreation opportunities for folks um, of all different backgrounds. So um, the way that I like to describe this is think of a state park where there's a boat launch, mountain biking trails, hiking trails, picnic areas, and playgrounds. There's something for everyone in those spaces. Um, I could spend this whole presentation talking about the history of fishing, but I'll keep it very brief for our purposes. Um, people have been using artificial lures to catch fish since the Roman Empire. Um, long cane rods and braided lines were introduced around the 1500s. 
and rod makers perfected, perfected their craft over the next few hundred years. Um, they started using improved materials like bamboo, which allowed anglers to cast further and fight larger fish with tighter lines. Um, and fly fishing in the U.S. started mainly in the heart of the Catskills uh, when colonizers arrived and found Atlantic salmon and brook trout runs in streams and rivers across the state. Um, and as advancements in equipment continued, dry fly fishing began in the late 1800s. Um, and dry flies are flies that float along the surface of the water rather than in the substrate of the water. Um, and in the late 1800s, that time period was actually designated the Catskill Dry Fly Revolution. So the Catskills and its anglers and guiding services really changed the landscape of what trout fishing looks like today. So fly fishing continued to grow in popularity until about the second half of the 1900s, um, when pursuit of fish with a fly rod declined a bit. Um, until 1992, when the movie A River Runs Through It was adapted into a film. Um, following the release of that movie, another boom was seen in participation in the sport. So that brings us to fly fishing today, where communities and towns across the world have built their economies around recreation tourism and specifically fly angling opportunities. And participation in the sport has grown yet again. And additionally, massive gains have been made in the technology and ability to catch um, exotic or what was thought to be impossible species on fly rods. Um, now people are driven all over the world to exotic locations like the salt flats of Dubai, the Seychelles off of East Africa, uh, the mangroves of Florida, and the Amazonian rainforest in pursuit of really extraordinary and mind-boggling fly fishing opportunities. Um, today, anglers across the world continue to push the bounds of what's possible with a fly rod um, while still holding steadfast to the foundational techniques um, and fly designs that started. Um, so while I'll go on to emphasize that, um, you know, we are in a male dominated arena in fly fishing, um, there were, of course, legendary women who were foundational to the growth of fly fishing. Um, first up is Helen Shaw, who's largely considered the first lady of fly tying. Um, in high school, she was supporting herself as a fly tire, and by age 20, she opened up her own fly tying business. Um, she turned down mass production opportunities in order to preserve the quality of her products. Um, and she went on to become such a renowned fly tire that she tied flies for President Herbert Hoover. Um, and she also went on to publish really foundational books in the field of fly tying. Joan Wolfe in the center here um, was winning casting competitions as early as the 1940s at local, regional, and national competitions, and most often against all male fields. Um, in 1951, at the National Fisherman's Distance Fly Championship, she became the first woman to win with a long cast of 136 feet. She went on to become the first female spokesperson for a major tackle company and also opened up her own fly fishing school in the heart of the Catskills, um, which is still open today and she still resides at today. Um, 80 years ago, she said that her casting skills put her on equal terms with any male angler. She was quoted saying, I was in a river with a bunch of men and I could cast as well or better than they could and they accepted me. Casting really allowed me to be in a man's sport. Lastly, and my favorite, we have Cornelia Flyrod Crosby, um, who was born in 1854 in a small town in Maine. Um, she worked many jobs um, over the years, but received her first fly rod from a local manufacturer in 1878. She went on to become a successful fly angler with a pretty big reputation. Um, local newspapers would regularly write and document about her escapades on the water. Um, she convinced Maine Central Railroad, which she worked for at the time, to sponsor an exhibit at the first annual Sportsman's Exposition in New York City. So she and two fishing guides brought a display that not only increased the visibility of the state of Maine in the Northeast, but also boosted tourism to the state for fishing, um, which is why she's considered a pioneer of angling as a destination sport. Um, she also lobbied for years for the licensing of guides as a way to generate funds for fish and game protection in the state. And despite the fact that she actually never became a guide, the state ceremoniously awarded Flyrod Crosby license number one in the year 1898. 
Um, she accomplished many other things in her time, um, including advancing sustainable catch limits for fish and game, um, and also red hat laws for hunter safety. So think about our first um, blaze orange laws in the country. Um, and these women and many more have made significant contributions to the world of fly fishing. So um, looking at trends today across recreation broadly, zooming out a little bit, according to the Outdoor Foundation's 2022 Outdoor Participation Trends Report, fishing was the third most popular recreation activity after running and hiking. So um, 52.4 million individuals fished in the year 2022. And of those individuals who went fishing, 13% of them were fly fishing. Um, and according to the same report, fly fishing has seen a 3% increase in participation based on five-year average trends. Um, women are now the fastest growing demographic in fly fishing, one of the most male-dominated outdoor sports. But in 2021, females accounted for only 30% of all fly anglers, missing the mark for Orvis's 50 by 50 initiative. Um, for 2020. And the 50 by 50 initiative, um, as you can imagine, aims to reduce the gender gap disparity across fly anglers um, in the field. And while it's more common to see women fly fishing today, they're still faced with many social and institutional constraints, which we'll talk more about. So this quote is pulled from a paper written by Rachel Crowder. And as we talk about barriers and constraints, I wanted to take the time to read this quote. It is an activity that has lots to offer women and at the same time offers lots that repel them. Male dominated fly fishing clubs are the norm and though open to women, they will not like the governments of countries dominated by men represent nor care about women's interests until they are sufficiently populated by women members to create a shift in the imbalance of power. Um, I think what this really emphasizes is that seeing yourself reflected in leadership roles um, is empowering and also irreplaceable, even with the support of men as allies and advocates in the field. So I'm going to take a minute to stop here and ask all of you some questions. Um, so when you think of your own barriers and constraints to outdoor recreation, what comes to mind? Um, you can either drop it in the chat and Tanya will read it out, um, or you can just unmute yourself and share with us. So thinking about those things that keep us from getting outside or the things that make it difficult to recreate, what are some of those things that come up for you when you think of your own barriers and constraints to accessing the outdoors? We have two people who say time takes is one. Yeah. No generational knowledge, lack of gear, lack of apparel. Those are excellent. Anything else from the chat, Tanya? That was it. I'll add lack of community. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, looking at barriers and constraints to outdoor recreation, um, they were really first realized by researchers in the 1970s. And early studies looking at barriers and constraints really mainly focused on gender and racial differences. But research over time evolved to examine socioeconomic factors and demographics like income, education, age, health, and also access and proximity to green space. So thinking about these factors a little bit more closely, right, education, age, health, and access to green space are all things that can marginalize groups from being able to access the outdoors and also participate and become invested in outdoor recreation activities. So there's three main categories of barriers and constraints that outdoor recreation researchers look at, and those are interpersonal, intrapersonal, and structural. So interpersonal are those interactions that we have with other folks, right? So this could be other anglers or fly shop staff that are not welcoming or standoffish um, and really exist in a culture of like competition and exclusion. 
the intrapersonal constraints are the voices that we hear inside. Those are things like body image, lack of self-confidence, fear of embarrassment, or guilt over missing responsibilities at home, which is a big one for women. Um, and so intrapersonal constraints come across as a really top constraint for women in outdoor recreation. And then the last one is structural. And these are the things that institutions or brands or organizations or even governments um, control. Um, so that could be lack of suitable and affordable waiters, right? They just don't sell women's waiters where you're going to shop. Um, there's nowhere to shop in person or infrastructure to fly fish just doesn't exist locally. Um, you may have waters that aren't really well suited for fly fishing in your region. Um, and so that becomes a structural barrier to accessing the sport. Um, and constraints to recreation, importantly, are more pronounced for people who are in non-dominant groups. And gender has long been established as an important variable in this discussion. Um, researchers in outdoor recreation fields have identified a lack of sense of entitlement to leisure time, especially among mothers, as a constraint to leisure for women. Um, due to caretaking roles and the demands of unpaid labor that childcare requires, um, mothers often face stronger leisure constraints related to time, finances, and also social acceptance. So even if they have the time and the finances to get out on the water, that social acceptance from their own communities or circles may not be there to step away from the home and take time away from their children. Um, in the U.S., studies of women's participation in the outdoors shows that women express higher concerns about their skill levels, body image, fear of harassment or embarrassment, and not fitting in. Um, for women who do succeed in outdoor professions, they're often perceived as a superwoman, um, thus suggesting that being a woman in the outdoors and being a successful woman in the outdoors is something outside of the norm. Um, and while that's a double-edged sword and we want to celebrate those women's accomplishments, sometimes we can place people on pedestals that, for those on their way up the ladder, um, make it seem further away and more impossible to reach. Um, in the next slide, I'll dive a bit deeper into some constraints for fishing specifically, but interpersonal, intrapersonal, and structural constraints all impact women's ability and willingness to participate in fly fishing. Um, and to provide some evidence to this, an example that I mentioned of structural constraints of not having access to waders that fit properly, um, Patagonia only released a line of waders and equipment for women in 2015, which was just four years before I started fishing and less than 10 years ago. So for constraints to fishing broadly, um, there was a study conducted in 2017 to look at constraints to participation in trout fishing based on skill and experience level specifically. So to help evidence the constraints new anglers uh, can face broadly, I'll share just a few of the results from this study. And it is worth noting that only 14% of this survey sample was female. So we can potentially assume that if uh, females had been better represented in this sample size, the constraints that came across as top constraints may look different. Um, the study results showed that interpersonal constraints like crowding and conflict with other anglers um, were reported to be the most limiting, followed by structural constraints like the cost of fishing and intrapersonal constraints like the lack of skill and lack of mentorship. Um, this study also identified something that I want to highlight the most skilled anglers face the least intrapersonal constraints. So things like lack of confidence, which could be assumed, but also importantly, they were the best equipped to navigate and overcome all of these identified constraints. And the reason that this is important to keep in mind is that not all anglers will possess the same constraint negotiation skills or the ability to overcome obstacles and barriers. And if they're not met with the right mentorship and support, that's when attrition occurs and people fall out and give up on the sport. So as I've mentioned, studies of fly fishing are minimal um, and those focused on the experiences of female anglers are even more rare. But a study by Fennell and Burbeck in 2019 looked to examine whether there were a distinct set of experiences that really defined the identity of a female fly angler. And these are some of their results. Um, of the 100 female fly anglers surveyed, 70% said males have been the primary fly fishing instructors in their lives. 52% reported having dealt with gender constraints on the water, and 77% said a male taught them how to fly fish. Now, again, because each survey um, or each study, it's important to focus on that sample, 
Um, these numbers may have been higher had they not chose a sample of women who were involved in a women's fly fishing group. So without that camaraderie and without the support of those other women, more of them may have reported having dealt with gender constraints on the water. Um, I can say from my own experience that this is my reality. So I know I just threw a lot at you there talking about barriers and mixing in some research there to kind of evidence our claims. Um, so let's zoom out for a minute and look at some takeaways. Um, anglers, as with any recreation user group, face constraints. Uh, newer anglers face more constraints and are also less fit to navigate those constraints effectively. Um, this can lead to fall off of retention from the sport um, and lack of mentorship is seen as a leading constraint. Women in recreation broadly face barriers and constraints that stem from within their environment and circumstances and or their institutional or corporate constraints. And while progress has been made, fly fishing is still a male dominated field with women experiencing gender specific constraints like finding suitable gear and stronger uh, intrapersonal constraints like lack of confidence. Um, women are the fastest growing demographic in fly fishing, and brands and retailers are starting to see them as serious clients and customers, but still only 30% of fly anglers are female. I also want to take a minute to mention that these barriers and constraints are obviously layered and amplified for women of color on the water and other minority groups. So, I guess that brings me to my story and my own experiences of gender constraints in fly fishing, and I have experienced none. <laughs> so sometimes you experience things in more subtle ways, like a man working at a fly shop and only making contact with your male counterpart, um, or the stares of men on the water that always come with a feeling of needing to overperform or perform well enough that they think that I know what I'm doing. There's also a lot of positive experiences too, of men sharing that they're excited to see me on the water, um, giving a nod and wishing me tight lines. Um, and then there's also moments like a few weeks ago when I was out on a trailhead and passed a mother and daughter and the mother looked at me with wide eyes and said, mommy, I wanna go fishing. And moments like that just really make your heart swell. Um, or the time that a father and his son and daughter started a conversation with me on the water in the Adirondacks and in sharing my knowledge to try to help set them up for success the next day, he said, are you a guide? You look like a guide, uh, which has to be the best compliment you can receive on the water. Um, and sometimes you feel it online and other times you feel it in real time on the water. I can remember living in Norfolk and I was fishing in one of my favorite spots, but in such a big city, uh, there were always spectators and competitive fishermen in these locations. Um, sounds travel across water and rock jetties a lot more effectively than people realize. Um, and this group of men kept making jokes about my pink jacket. I started getting frustrated trying to rationalize why these grown men uh, are spending so much time talking about me fishing in my pink jacket and so little time actually catching fish. Um, so after a while and a lot of frustration, I landed the first fish amongst the slew of anglers there that day. And I laughed at the reality of the situation and yelled back to them that my pink jacket is my lucky jacket, <laughs> which wasn't totally untrue. And this encounter made me own my pink jacket a little bit more each time I wore it. I had many polarizing experiences in this same location, which was my favorite fishing spot, over and over and over again. Um, and both, as I said, both of these pictures are from that spot. Um, but there was once a man who was in disbelief that my boyfriend took his girl fishing. Um, and he went on to say the quiet part out loud, saying that his ego could never handle it if his girl was better than him. And so he just couldn't take her out fishing. Um, another day after completing a job interview and working on a research manuscript and a presentation and doing a 5 a.m. run that morning to a different fishing spot, um, I hooked into this redfish pictured on the right in the evening from the rocks at this favorite fishing spot. Um, there was a boat full of men right off the shore, close enough that I could see their faces, uh, but far enough away that I couldn't hear them. Um, but I still filled with anxiety, only concerned with what they would think if I lost this fish. Uh, they all froze and stared completely silently as I fought this fish in. And when it hit the net, they absolutely roared. And I could hear them screaming in excitement for me and clapping and cheering. And in those moments, I never stopped to, number one, be present and actually appreciate that moment for what it was. 
um, or think about what they would think if I landed the fish. Um, and these are the waves that you ride as a female fly angler. There are high highs and low lows, and I have experienced all of them even in the spectrum of a single day. Just last week, I was at a fly shop, which I won't name, and I think it's worth mentioning that I was his first customer of the afternoon after mentioning that his sales are down by tens of thousands of dollars this year. The conversation eventually drifts to the, why there's a lack of females in fly fishing, and after we get done discussing why that may be, he said the shop removed all of the women's waders they carried in store because they weren't purchased enough and women are the worst types of customers and always try to haggle them on prices. I left with my purchases and a hope that one day women are fully valued as consumers in every fly shop. So there are days where things like this don't bother me, and there's days that I've left the water crying and frustrated, and there's days I've contemplated quitting. Uh, but most days, I pushed myself so damn hard beyond the limits of my comfort zone, despite the fear of embarrassment, and put myself in some really challenging environments led by men. And I'm lucky to have found my way to the Virginia Coastal Fly Anglers Group. Um, my partner told me this group rented a house each year and traveled to Harker's Island, North Carolina to fish for false albacore in the fall. Uh, the average age of attendees is about 65 to 70. And the thought kind of made me feel sick to my stomach. And I immediately started weighing the questions of, am I good enough, experienced enough? Am I too intense of a personality? Uh, but I went. And on the sign-up sheet my first year, the list of attendees said, Fred and Michaela, parentheses, female. Uh, as I was the lone lady. <laughs> and this house and these experiences changed my life. Mike Buss, the organizer of the annual VCFA trip to Harker's, uh, put me on my first Albies on the fly this year after my second year traveling down. My first year, my fish never made it to the boat. Um, and Mike's personality and his sheer size as such a huge man uh, fill a room. And hearing his loud booming laugh as I fought this fish in uh, just absolutely fueled my soul. Um, and I feel really lucky to have had that experience with him in a place where he's been coming back to as long as I've been alive. And to really, uh, you know, one of the things that's the hardest to communicate about a fly fishing presentation is trying to tell people what it actually feels like to have a fish run on you. Um, so an Albi running on your fly line is one of the most exciting moments you can have. Um, you freak out when you feel the force of a fish like that bending your rod. Um, you get your line tight and your drag is running and something in your heart just absolutely stops. And if you're lucky and everything lines up and one of the thousand things that could go wrong does not, you'll land it. And if not, your line wraps around your rod, the rod snaps, the fish breaks off, and it's all over in about half a second. Um, and I want to say now that um, there have been several formative men from this house and elsewhere in my life that have empowered me and been effective advocates and supporters of me and my growth in fly fishing. And I'm eternally grateful for their mentorship. And fly fishing has been liberating for me in so many ways, um, building new skills, self-sufficiency, my sense of personal power and confidence um, in all aspects of my life, both per personal and professionally on the water, um, and also just feeling like the strongest I ever have as a woman. And like I'm really growing into the best version of myself in my late 20s. And I've also um, realized that fly fishing is critical to my mental health, and it's given me an outlet for self-care for the rest of my life. Um, I do believe that fly fishing is a pathway to environmental stewardship and conservation. It's made me a better conservationist, being able to understand um, systems level approaches to environmental management and knowing that what's good for the environment is good for fishing and good for me. Um, it really aligns everything in my life. Um, and I'm about to share some women who really inspire me today. But if I had some type of message that I could try to pull from all of these varied experiences, it's that you can walk into a world where you're the odd man out or the odd woman out. <laughs> and with confidence and a lot of really hard work, you can shift perceptions and narratives that dominate the conversation. Um, that doesn't mean it won't be exhausting uh, in the meantime. So first up here is Sarah Gartner. She's the most respected woman and guide in Harker's Island, North Carolina. And she and her husband, Brian, give Albies a run for their money. And here she is catching one uh, from the beach uh, shortly after we left Harker's Island this past fall. Uh, next up is Hillary Hutchinson. Um, she's a fly shop owner and guide and climate activist first. 
Um, Hillary once said in an interview that being built for the wild means that you have to have the right bones, guts, heart, and armor to work and play the way that you want. And I always really appreciated that quote. Um, Hillary's focus on climate activism in the world of fly fishing has cons consistently inspired me. Um, and last but certainly not least is Jenny Tates, um, who's a champion for women on the water and works to connect female anglers through her work in the Northeast and specifically Massachusetts. And she actually just returned to the water to guide yesterday um, after having her second child. Um, she shared online yesterday that she FaceTimed her kids from the water at home with fish blitzing all around her boat and they cheered, go mama. Um, and there's really no better example of, uh, of, of the power of women than a moment like that. Um, and if there's one benefit to social media, it's that we have the ability to follow and be inspired by countless women just getting after it and making it happen. So that leaves us with kind of one last important take home message, um, which is how can we help women feel at home on the water? Um, for one, and this one goes out to any of the men listening in tonight, uh, support women, help them feel welcomed, comfortable, and capable in spaces where they're not well represented. Offer them mentorship if they need it, and you're a person who can provide that, or help connect them to a mentor. And most importantly, take them seriously. <laughs> <laughs> There's always this old saying that you can't be what you can't see, and we need more women guides on the water and behind the counters at fly shops. Um, I come back to that quote that while open to women, these male dominated spaces will never fully serve women unless women are in equal roles of power in these spaces. Of the three types of constraints uh, that are faced, um, reducing structural constraints can really aid women in getting started in fly fishing and getting out on the water. Um, making sure that waders and equipment are available in fly shops locally and in diverse size ranges as well. Help women be well informed of the opportunities for fishing available. Take them to a fishing spot and give them that insight. Help them get started. Um, and what might be most important, and especially for moms, is helping them make time to invest in themselves and their hobbies outside of the home. Offering childcare or finding them a mentor to help teach them the basics um, can be really transformative. And whether it's fishing or not, make sure the women in your lives have the opportunity to step away from the home and invest back in themselves, not just the next generation that they're helping raise. Um, and the last piece I'll offer is women supporting women. Throughout my life, I have been blessed with circles of women who have lifted each other up and built each other up. Um, and when you get to the top, they always say to be sure to look back and uplift the next woman as you were her not long ago. So that concludes my presentation on women in fly fishing, my own journey, and how we can help support and uplift other women. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank all of you for your time and attention this evening, and also thanks to RPA and the Speaker Series Committee for inviting me for this opportunity. Um, on this slide, you'll see the United Women on the Fly website, um, which is committed to building an inclusive community that educates, provides resources, encourages, and connects anglers from all backgrounds to the sport of fly fishing. Um, I would encourage you to check out their website and explore online communities of women on the fly. Um, while we think about questions and kind of put our thoughts together here, I'm going to play this video from my trip to Harker's Island this past fall uh, for your viewing pleasure. <laughs>
great. And now I am happy to answer uh, any questions that that anyone may have for me. I see I see some stuff blowing up in the chat here. Yeah, so there's a lot of great feedback, Michaela. Everyone's enjoyed your presentation a lot. Um, some people want you to guide them. Uh, I'm one of them. I'll join. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so question, how is saltwater fly fishing different from freshwater? Yeah, yeah. So the um, there's a couple of kind of main characteristics that... Um, change when you jump from freshwater to saltwater. Um, so for one, you're using uh, bigger, heavier rods. Um, so when you're fishing the trout streams here in Rensselaer County, you're often using um, like a two weight rod to a five to six weight rod on average, um, catching things like pike and bass on five and six weight and trout on three weights. Um, and when you transition to saltwater fly fishing, you can get up into rods in the classes of like a 12 weight, a 10 weight, a nine weight. Um, and you're using um, uh, heavier flies. Um, another big characteristic is just the dynamics of understanding the fishery. Um, reading a stream um, and looking at pockets of water is much different than trying to navigate the open abyss of the ocean. Um, you're often using electronics, so things like fish finders um, to aid you in your quest when you're fishing saltwater. Um, and there's more variables to consider with things like tides, moon cycles, king tides. Um, and so I would say those are probably the, um, the main differences between saltwater and freshwater angling. Great, thanks. How does fly fishing in the capital region or on the plateau compare with other places where you fished? Are there any good holes locally? Yeah, so um, I will say that um, there's this saying called the tug is the drug. Um, and when you get into bigger fish, so like saltwater fly fishing, um, for me, it kind of changed the game. Um, and so I actually do have a preference for saltwater fly angling over freshwater. Um, but locally, um, I have had excellent success across Rensselaer County um, in fishing the streams and waters that we have. The Kinderhook Creek is actually considered um, an excellent uh, trout fishing stream. Um, and I've caught some, some beautiful specimens in there. Um, and we also have, um, I think that one of the questions was, are there good fishing holes locally? Um, so we have great fishing holes, even owned by Rensselaer Plateau Alliance and Rensselaer Land Trust. Um, I have had success fishing across our properties as well. And the Kinderhook Creek Preserve is an excellent place to, uh, to explore and very accessible in terms of wading access. Great, thanks, Michaela. Um, how about catch and release versus catching to eat? Can you talk about sort of the difference and how that feels to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will say um, that I am uh, virtually exclusively a catch and release angler. Um, there, I've only ever eaten one fish that was caught by someone else and not me. Um, and, and that's really more just a, a point of um, personal preference. Um, if I was in saltwater fly fishing, I would probably uh, potentially harvest more of my catches uh, for things like redfish, which are great to eat. Um, but locally, um, I am always under the impression that if I catch a really impressive fish, I'd like to have the next angler uh, be able to have that same opportunity. Um, and so for me, catch and release is one of the ways that I... Um, help navigate the impacts that I have on local fisheries. Um, in addition to using techniques like um, low impact handling, keeping fish wet, making sure your hands are wet when you're handling fish um, and things like that can help ensure the vitality of, uh, of waterways and of fisheries. Thanks. What resources, knowledge and so on do you want that you had as a young woman just starting to be involved in outdoor recreation? Mm, that's an excellent question. Um, so I think, I think what I wish I had information to is that all other women were experiencing the same feelings that I was. <laughs> it's, uh, it's that uh, feeling that you can feel so alone in a room full of people. Um, and I think that there's a lot of women that face the same constraints and struggles uh, trying to navigate spaces that weren't built for them. Um, 
And I wish that I just saw someone that looked like me that was navigating those spaces. And I think that again, is, is one of the greatest, um, benefits to social media that we have today is this access to information and also access to storytelling um, of other women who have done it before us and um, are navigating these same constraints. Um, and then in terms of resources, um, I will say something that this area is still lacking. Um, we don't have a fly shop locally. Our closest fly shop is in Gloversville, um, so about an hour away from here. Um, and so having that knowledge in person, be able to walk into a fly shop and speak to someone um, is really irreplaceable. Um, and so I think, you know, between knowing that I was being heard and having my feelings validated by other women, and then also just having access to the resource of a local fly shop um, is something that would have really uh, been helpful for me. Do you use wet flies in the ocean? Maybe define wet versus dry flies. Yeah, yeah. So dry flies um, are, again, the types of flies that um, when you think of people saying the term like match the hatch, when you go out in the evening time and you look across a stream and you see bugs just dancing across the water, um, those are what we mimic when we use dry flies. Um, is, is this fly that just barely dances across the water and a fish will come up and you'll see a really visible eat, which is always really exciting and more exciting than catching something with a streamer under the water's surface. Um, so when you're fishing in the ocean, um, virtually all of your flies are um, sinking flies. Um, you can sometimes use poppers. Um, poppers are something that push a lot of water and they're jumping across the water's surface. Um, but primarily you're using sinking flies, you're using things with lead eyes so that they sink at a rate that matches the rate of your sinking fly line. Um, and that's where we get really technical and into uh, sink rates and things like that. But generally speaking, bigger flies and all flies that sink um, for saltwater fly angling. Thanks, Michaela. Anyone else have more questions? Oh, what is your favorite fish to catch and see up close? Mm, that's a good question. Um, my favorite fish to catch are false albacore. Um, I think that there's nothing more exciting than the feeling of losing control a little bit. Um, and when a fish is running on your line so aggressively, you're like, I hope that they stop and turn around <laughs> so that you can fight the fish back. Um, so I think false albacore for... Um, for the excitement is my favorite fish to catch, but seeing fish up close, I actually love looking at brown trout and brook trout. Um, the, the colors and the variations that you see can be amazing. And, and when you start paying really close attention, you can start telling the difference between native and stocked trout as well. Um, because there are some pretty distinct differences in what you see coming out of a hatchery and what you see that has spawned for generations in, you know, an Adirondack stream, for example. Um, so those can always uh, be a lot of fun. What's the biggest fish you've ever caught? Mm, biggest fish I've ever caught um, was biggest saltwater fish I've ever caught um, was this redfish in the center photo here with my pink jacket. Um, that was the biggest saltwater, uh, fish I've ever caught. And the biggest, um, freshwater fish that I've ever caught was actually a pike out of Kinderhook Lake about two weeks ago. Wow. What's the right age to teach a kid to tie a fly? Uh, as early as they can hold something in their hands. <laughs> I think, um, some of the, Greatest examples of kind of kids um, just being fully immersed in the world of fly fishing are the sons and daughters of some of the guides that I know personally. Um, you know, I'm thinking of um, our friend from Hilltown Anglers in Massachusetts. Um, he has a son who is absolutely obsessed with doing anything his dad does um, and will sit there and tie his flies. I think he's only about five or six um, and can effectively tie nymphs. He ties his own flies, fills his own boxes. Um, and he pretends that he's making YouTube videos and streaming to his followers. <laughs> so I think kids are, um, much more capable than we give them credit for. And I think the earlier that you introduce 
kids to these experiences, not only can they hone their skills, um, but their passion just uh, becomes unremarkable. Um, and, you know, that I, I would say if anything in life I could redo, it would be uh, starting to fish sooner for sure. Thanks, Michaela. Does anyone else have questions? And I guess I'll do one more shameless plug as well that uh, if anyone is in the market for flies, uh, my partner Fred has his own fly tying business <laughs> by the name of First Cast Flies. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, well thank then. you very much everyone uh, for your time and attention and your thoughtful questions. Um, you know, I hope if anything, um, this excites you to try something that scares you a little bit, um, because it's always been scary and it's still a little scary <laughs> and, um, it's just great to immerse yourself in something that, that really challenges you and fuels your soul. Thanks, Michaela. Thanks everyone for joining us. See you in the fall when we start our next season. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Thank you.